Bacon had two main faults to find with the learning of his day. The first had to do with its bondage to the past. In this respect, he considered Renaissance humanists and Protestant theologians worse offenders than the schoolmen, because they gave far too much attention to the ancient languages, to style and phrase, to the correction and annotation of texts. In his opinion, it was time for scholars to wake up to the age in which they were living. No longer need Europeans feel overawed by the achievements of Greece and Rome. What we call antiquity was in fact the youth of the world. These times are the ancient times when the world is ancient, and not those which we account ancient by a computation backward from ourselves. The second main fault was in mistaking the goal or purpose of knowledge. Two great precedents had, he thought, been given to intellectual activity and not enough to practical investigations. Bacon pleaded for scholars to lay aside vain speculations and to turn to the contemplation of nature and the observation of experience. Contemplation, he said, should ever be conjoined with action and should be pursued not out of mere intellectual curiosity or for the honor or gain of the scholar, but for its utility to civil society. In the second and more substantial part of the advancement of learning, Bacon turned his attention from the scholars to the matter of their scholarship. His purpose was to point out areas of study that had not received sufficient attention, and in passing to note those that had not been neglected. Among the latter he placed mathematics and physics, grammar and eloquence, ancient and ecclesiastical history. This was not to say that he considered them in a satisfactory condition. I am not now, he noted, in hand with censures, but with omissions. Of physics, for example, which he did not report as deficient, he nevertheless noted, in what truth or perfection its branches are handled, I make not now any judgment, but they are parts of knowledge not deserted by the labor of men. Bacon's originality appears in the number of new sciences which he envisioned a place for, and the gaps he saw in the old ones. For example, he urged that modern history should be studied with the same zeal as ancient, and he called for a new science that would study human races in connection with climate, geography, and natural resources. There was need for a science of education and for books on practical morals which would deal with ways of improving the mind and cultivating virtue. A history of mechanics and inventions was needed to parallel the history of thought. And handbooks were needed in the fields of business and diplomacy, comparable in form of writing to Machiavelli's works on government. Theology might seem to be over-cultivated, but Bacon suggested two new areas, one dealing with the limits of human reason in speculating about divine things, the other defining the latitude which ought to be allowed for theological differences. Medicine, Bacon thought, was in a particularly deficient way, being a science which hath been more professed than labored, and yet more labored than advanced, the labor having been in my judgment rather in a circle than in progression. He complained that Hippocrates' method of keeping case histories of his patients had fallen into disuse. He argued for the reinstitution of vivisection, particularly of beasts, in order that anatomy might again go forward, and he wished that physicians would give more attention to searching out specific medicines and less to compounding confections for ready sale. As would be expected, Bacon gave special attention to the arts of reasoning, anticipating many of the themes of his famous Novum Organum. He argued that invention has been far too much the sport of chance rather than the child of intelligence. Hitherto men are rather beholden to a wild goat for surgery, or to a nightingale for music, or to the ibis for some part of physic, or to the pot lid that flew open for artillery, or generally to chance or anything else than to logic for the invention of arts and sciences. Bacon recommended several new angles of approach. He pointed out the importance to invention of the negative instance and the exception to the rule. Consequently, he strongly recommended keeping calendars of doubts and problems and popular errors together with a history of the wonders and monstrosities of nature. He mentioned the need of putting nature to torture in order to make her answer our questions. He criticized the adequacy of syllogistic reasoning for the investigation of nature, and he urged a more particular induction. Also, he pointed to characteristic fallacies which he was later to call the idols of the mind. Perhaps more important than any of these details is the new principle of the classification of the sciences which Bacon employed in this work, 
several features of which deserve notice. In the first place, he drew a sharp division between human learning and divine, the obvious purpose of which was to set human reason free from the authority of revelation. In the second place, he divided human learning into three main parts, paralleling the three parts of man's understanding. Memory, he saw as the basis for all kinds of history, natural, civil, ecclesiastical. Imagination as the basis for poesy, narrative, representative, and elusive. And reason as the basis for philosophy, divine, natural, and human. Bacon's emphasis upon the divisions within philosophy has been influential in empirical circles to this day. He deprecated the generalized kind of thinking which schoolmen called philosophy and parceled out its matter to special sciences. It was, he thought, rather a depredation of other sciences than anything solid and substantive itself. In its place, he proposed a new discipline under the name of first philosophy, which would be a receptacle for axioms and rules which are valid for several parts of knowledge. Such a science, were it cultivated, would prove a fruitful fountain from which all might draw. Of special interest is the account he gave of the relation between physics and metaphysics. Both, in his view, are branches of natural science, the former dealing with material and efficient causes, the latter with formal and final causes. Physics, in his estimation, stands above natural history in that it is explanatory and not merely descriptive, but it is below metaphysics in that it sees causes in their particularity. For example, if the cause of whiteness in snow or froth is inquired, physics will explain that it is due to the subtle intermixture of air and water. Metaphysics must explain it in terms of the form of whiteness and show why this particular intermixture of elements is united with this universal character. Bacon said he was not surprised that little progress had been made in metaphysics understood in this way, because men had not paid enough attention to particulars. But he also let escape the doubt that much could ever be accomplished in this direction. Natural philosophy, he said, is like a pyramid, with natural history at the base, physics as the middle, and metaphysics as the vertical point. But, as for the vertical point, the summary law of nature, we know not whether man's inquiry can attain to it. It is not difficult to see that behind the new division of the sciences lay Bacon's complete rejection of the medieval synthesis of Aristotle and St. Augustine. Without repudiating theology, he sealed it off, restricting divine knowledge to faith, manners, liturgy, and church government. As for Aristotelianism, while Bacon preserved much of its terminology, he rejected its fundamental tenets and turned to Democritus, the materialistic atomist, for his model of the world. Compare in this respect his younger friend, Thomas Hobbes. The new system of classification also points up the anthropocentric, humanistic in the 20th century sense of the word, character of Bacon's thinking. Bacon did not accept Copernicus's theory of the heavens, but the kind of Copernican revolution which Kant claimed to have brought about was incipient in Bacon's decision to abandon the traditional division of the sciences based on nature and to reorganize knowledge according to the faculties of the mind. For example, Bacon brought botany and the rise and fall of civilizations together as branches of a single kind of inquiry. One is natural history, the other civil history. What they have in common is the fact that they are both founded in man's memory and observation, rather than in imagination or reason. Bacon made no secret of his conviction that all knowledge has for its end the use and benefit of man. This attitude is evident from what has appeared already in what has been said about the necessity of combining contemplation with action and in the deficiency he reported in respect to mechanical and practical knowledge. He was the champion of the kind of learning we associate with polytechnic colleges, business schools, and research institutes. His bias is underscored by the disproportion in the amount of space which he devotes to human philosophy, 15 chapters, as against natural philosophy. Two chapters. Know thyself, he said, following the ancient oracle, for the knowledge of man is the end and term of human learning, notwithstanding the fact that it is but a portion of the continent of nature. Bacon thought of himself as standing on the threshold of a new age. Among its harbingers, he mentioned the vivacity of the wits of that time, the improved knowledge of the past, the invention of printing, worldwide navigation, the increase of leisure and political stability. 
he spoke of the period as constituting a third great age in the history of the world, which he hoped would far exceed in glory and achievement the days of Greece and Rome.